and it's headphones nail. I'm your host, as always, Headphones Neil, bringing you a good hodgepodge of different things to review for this week. So let's jump right into it. So I'm going to start off with probably my favorite review of the week, notably the release of Eminem's latest album, The Death of Slim Shady, Coup de Gras. So overall, um, one of the things I heard about going into it was that you had to listen to the album in order, otherwise it wouldn't be as good of an experience. So I'm still not sure about that particular statement, but overall, when you're listening to the album, it does hold up as one of his better albums. Um, to me, it serves as a good sequel to The Eminem Show, which prior to a couple of his albums since then um the eminem show is kind of a good mix of all of his talents um he kind of um started doing more you know speed rapping and having more intricate verses and stuff on later albums but the eminem show actually serves to me as a good basis for all of that it's kind of that intermediary between his prior albums the slim shady lp and the marshall mathers lp and then everything that came um, in after that through, you know, recovery, um, the um, horror one with Alfred Hitchcock and um, basically just, yeah, just everything since then. So for me, this is a good sequel to that. It also has very um, various beats and um, inspirations from his other albums. So um, notably in the name where he's, you know, killing off the Slim Shady character. So there's a lot of... Um, connections to that album and then you know similarities in style to you know songs from recovery the marshall mathers lp a few other um, albums after that and all of that so um it serves to show as his growth since those early albums in his career um so if you're an eminem fan then i definitely recommend giving the album a listen um i enjoy it for the most part for all of that there are a few tracks that stand out um that are better than others but there's none that i can say that i actively dislike i do like them all in various capacities so i recommend listening to the album um in other news we had the season finale for star wars the acolyte so on the to do a comparison to something i liked this week um something that did not hold up by the time we got to the finale was um the acolyte season one so um one of the things that st the show started off interesting to the point where you want we wanted to learn about um osha and may the j current status of the jedi order but by the time we get to the season finale the thing that stands out for the show is all of the um visuals of it so the lightsaber battles um the locations the night sisters and then like notably in the season finale that starship battle through the asteroid field so when you are um um going watching the finale things like that will stand out as good but the um season doesn't actually resolve anything to me so uh we learn about osha and may as a virgin in the force um that they're you know good light side dark side in their personalities uh we have this mysterious um sith supposedly sith warrior we have the jedi trying to find out what happened you know um souls friend, jedi friend from coruscant now coming after him to find out what happened to the jedi search party but beyond that they don't actually solve anything figure anything out you know may ends up going or osha the light-sided twin ends up going with that sith guy um but we and then we have in the season finale the um teaser for darth plagueis hiding out in the shadows kind of along the lines of like a golem kind of character where he's he doesn't really give the presence of a Sith Lord. We, we kind of get the presence of um, someone who's losing his power. So um, potentially he, and speculating now, all I could think of was that he might be low on his power and he's trying to look for someone's um, life energy to suck their power from. Um, so that, that would kind of explain how um, Sidious was able to drain the life force from 
Ray and um, Ben Kenobi from the Rise of or from yeah from the Rise of Skywalker. Um, so potentially that's why we see him in his weakened state and we have his apprentice or acolyte going out into the world. Um, and then probably we see him in the shadows because he now because maybe his um, apprentice was looking for a new um, apprentice of his own to take on Plagueis and now that Plagueis knows this he's going to take him out or something. But all of this is speculation. None of that was actually relayed in the show. We have no other um, presentation of Plagueis, what he's up to, what the Sith are up to, why they are doing what they're doing. Is there a connection with the Night Sisters or not? Um, or the Night Sisters working on the orders of Plagueis to create this um, Virgis in the Force? So. I guess they always say that the good sign of storytelling is they leave you asking questions and want, leave you wanting more. But in this case, I kind of take away from that because they didn't bring us enough to say that uh, they didn't like they started answering questions but didn't really answer anything. So a lot of this season could have been accomplished in the first four episodes, or we need another eight episodes to complete out the rest of the story. Um, to the point where that's why to me the revelation of um, Plagueis in the finale along with Yoda as a, at the very end of the episode serves to me as more of a mid-season finale rather than an actual season one finale or any season finale because they weren't introduced at any other point in the episode and uh, no one ever went to talk to them. We didn't know that they existed until the very end of the season. So. For me, I'm happy that my theory that this is going to be related to Plagueis it, um, happened, but they didn't go far enough. They didn't tell us a good enough story to actually leave me wanting. I, I mean, for me as a Star Wars fan, I do want more. I do want a second season to um, find out what happens, get more of the Plagueis story arc. Let's connect more of the um, Old Republic to the um, Empire, to the prequels and all of that. But all of this did, wasn't actually presented well in the Acolyte to the point where we can say that, okay, yeah, we see this stuff going on. We know that, you know, even if it's a, um, you know, a, a quick a few scenes in one of the episodes in the finale. So like, for example, with Plagueis, if we didn't need to see, if we saw, you know, him standing in his lab, overhearing the conversation with his apprentice and Osha and realizing that his apprentice is looking for an apprentice and he needs to get rid of him to teach him a lesson or whatever like show that so we actually have that connection it could have been a simple you know 30 second scene to explain that at that in the season finale and then same thing with um master yoda um sh have, keep that you know end of episode revelation but um have, show him you know calling on the the jedi lady that was working with soul and say you know i need to speak with you come to my chambers and talk about it or actually have a conversation between the two and say you know master yoda i have the information you are looking for or i have some information that requires your attention and have him reply with you know something master yoda would say with you know uh, even have him repeat what he said in the prequels like um, is this related to a virgins in the force or something and then end it there like have a proper conversation between the two so that's why for me I kind of give that season a grade of around a C plus to B minus like I said the visuals were good the base story was fine but they didn't tell enough in eight episodes they were kind of stringing us along and doing a lot of the same story from different points of view so um that's why it's kind of hard for me i mean i say as a star wars fan to rec i recommend watching it but um in general it was an okay um season so it's like all right well i guess now i'm gonna string myself along and say all right well let's see what they do in the second season and if they explain more of the story or do the same story from the point of view of Plagueis and what he's been doing and provide more of that backstory to round out the first season. I guess that would make it a little bit better, but um, so that's kind of where I'm at with it. And I could, I'll, I guess, adjust my grading if we do get a better story for season two. 
Um, from here, as far as House of the Dragon goes, we have the uh, continuing repercussions of the events of the prior episode. So um, the king is not dead. He's just terribly injured, but he is on the verge of death. So um, Aemon, the 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 child the kid the the targaryen that looks like a younger version of daemon is assuming the king's place taking over the small council um making choice decisions on behalf of the king as he sees fit so um there's that we have uh renera renera the, the the queen lady who's um fighting for everything at dragonstone um trying making more decisions um and dealing with all the fallout on her end so still like a continue more of a stepstone episode to um deal with like kind of as a follow-up to the prior episode uh same thing with damon he's dealing with his with the demons at heron hall so trying to keep a sane mind as far as mind as far as what's happening there so nothing special of note as far as um all that goes but um Nothing bad presented, it's um, all very nicely done, so definitely can't wait for more episodes each week there. And then in related news, I had a chance to finish my watch through of Game of Thrones, so I got through seasons 5 through 8. And overall for me, I still hold to the theory that overall the final seasons were not terrible. I still maintain that when you have, um, you know, I'll say 15 storylines, I think that's the number I used before, and now you're down to three, of course the story is going to feel like it's moving faster than it did because you don't have as many stories to deal with. You know, in the beginning, you you have to deal with all the families, all the locations, King Land, King's Landing, um, Varys and Littlefinger, uh, the Targaryens across the sea, the Dothraki. You're, um, and then you know you're dealing with the War of the Five Kings, you're the Red Wedding, and all of that stuff. And then you're moving into the you know you, then also you add on top of that Jon Snow and the uh, White Walkers, the Night's Watch, um, him dying, coming back to life, and all of that. So once you start narrowing, you know, taking away all those storylines and focusing on just the Starks, the Targaryens, and the Lannisters. And actually, my number of three makes a lot more sense that, you know, if you go from 15 to three, that actually is the reason why the ending seems really rushed and fast. As far as the season finale, the thing that still bothers me is that they call Brand, Brand, Brand the Broken, which kind of still annoys me. It's like, call, stop calling him. Like, he's on one hand, Tyrion calling him that is one thing because of his whole thing in um, the, f the first season when he's talking to jo John about use what they're gonna use their name calling to your advantage as and as a shield and it'll never hurt you. So that that's on one hand, but on the other hand, um, you know, call him Brand the Builder, Brand the Rebuilder, or whatever, and do something more on a positive note and take it from there. Um, so I don't mind him being the king, but the only thing for me personally, like not to, nit I mean, to nitpick the ending, I would have actually preferred that they made John the king because he didn't, you know, the whole thing with Varys was that he was right. And because John kills Daenerys, that that all works out, have them all elect John the king. Um, and the whole thing with him and Grey Worm, that Grey Worm doesn't, um, like that Grey Worm wants him to um, die for killing their queen. Um, either explain that to him better or, you know, exile them, let them, you know, the whole thing was Sansa and the, um, you know, all the northern armies there to fight the Unsullied and say that they're not um, fighting or they're not making John the King because he, you know, as a reward for what he did there, you know, it's not a punishment either, but also they fought together. They killed her because of what she was doing. She's doing these things to free people, but then she's going crazy herself. Like he has to understand these nuances and not following blindly. That's what got them into trouble to begin with. So, um, make it so that he's exiled and not that they're not punishing him for and they're not exiling him but they're like they're accept they're you know accepting that of what they did to help get them to where they are but Daenerys destroyed the entire city she you know she didn't have to do that but she did it anyways so she's no different than her father's uh while 
And also, and while they're at it, you know, reveal the truth about John that he's also a Targaryen. Send, you show everyone the book from the Citadel so they all believe it, um, because it is still Sam and Bran that reveal that information. And show them that he's also a Targaryen. He's, you know, he did all these things um, without going crazy, so he's the better ruler. Not because he's the Targaryen, not because he's the male heir, but because he is actually doing things for the people. He could have done a lot of things, but he didn't, so... Make him the king, make Bran um, the hand of the king and the master of whispers because of uh, him being the thir uh, three eyed raven. Um, make Sam the um, grand maester. And alternatively, in, if they don't want to um, exile Grey Worm, they can make him um, the commander of all their armies and say, tell him that, you know what, because of what he did, he, because of the of all their abilities, they're a better army than anyone else can be, they're uncorruptible. And so if he sees John going corrupt, doing that things, asking them to do things that are against what they're deciding there that day, that they're authorized to overthrow him, like explain those things to him because he, um, because of what Daenerys did to free them, because of how um, John's character is and all of that, like do, you know, not, it's not punishing anybody, it's not rewarding anybody, it's putting everyone in a place where they fit best. Um, as far as Sansa and the North goes, that whole thing about not keeping the North as part of the Seven Kingdoms, the whole thing with Jon becoming king would have kept the Seven Kingdoms together and Sansa would be warden of the North, so she's still a northern person is still ruling the North, a Stark is still ruling the North, and they're part of the Seven Kingdoms because they're following Jon as their king. Um, and then as far as Arya goes, um, her being that explorer works well. Um, nothing really different there. I actually like that part of her character that she's going to go explore, expand everything. She can be that person that goes around to, you know, be hand to the, the maester, like be Sam's assistant where she goes and, you know, finds out information, goes and verifies brand stories and things like that. She's like basically a, um, a utility knife or a um, Swiss army knife of things. Like she, she, she does whatever is asked of her from the high council only, goes and gets information, finds out stuff and does all of that different stuff. So, um, kind of that's kind of the ending that i would have preferred for all of that so um i don't know that's probably a better ending than what with was provided but something that and i don't know if it is actually better or not but it's an ending that would have worked um best for me um so with that being said um i did have a chance to play or continue playing roller coaster tycoon so i played the emerald group level pacific pyramids um, in general, a good, easy level, you know, it's not a very ex um, expansive park, so there is a lot of places to, that you have to like get crowded in, but one of the things is I did build around the pyramid, so, um, kind of keep the decorations there, make the rides a little bit more fun by, um, putting them around the existing monuments, um, but it is easy to make money back, so if you have, um, um, good, right priced rides, so, you know, that five to nine dollar mark, depending on what's affordable that people like, then you'll make your money back quick. Um, and once you build your rides around that big plateau, then you can start um, using the money you have because you've paid off all your loans to flatten up that plateau and start building rides on top of that. And you're going to be able to get to enough guests in the park to fulfill the um the guest requirements so as always keep your queue lines long and pay attention to rides that um you can make you know free to keep the ride the queue going um make sure the prices are high enough so that on um, other rides so that um you're making a lot of you know, all your money back from them and all of that so um overall a fun park um towards the end i did have enough people but i also did have money enough money to um build more rides so i kept doing that and playing around with it on the plateau but overall not too much to say it is a tight park so do pay it so you do have to work a little bit at getting enough guests in there but like i said keep your queue lines long and build around the pyramids and around the plateau through the plateau and all of that and you should have enough room to build all your rides and fulfill the requirements 
Um, and then to round out this particular episode, so now that I'm done with my Knights of the Old Republic 2 gameplay, um, I did have a chance to start playing another game, so I was thinking about which Doom mods I wanted to play next, so searching around I found one called Pirate Doom, where you're playing as a pirate Doom guy, you're, the levels look like they're all themed around various pirate locations, including the um, traditional monsters have, like the, the imps have eye patches on them, the... I, haven't, I don't think I've seen Caco Demons, and I did run into one Archwile. I couldn't quite make out how he was um, themed, but the enemies are all themed accordingly to pirate-based stuff. So, um, you know, I was on a beach and on a boat and all of that. So, so far it seems like a fun gameplay. It looks like there's only 18 levels on it, so not the traditional um, 30. So it should be a pretty fast gameplay. It's a more progressive difficulty of the game, so... Seems like it should go pretty smoothly until it starts getting a little bit more difficult, but these first couple of levels haven't been too bad. I think I've been on par with myself as far as the time it takes to get through them, um, but overall I'm enjoying it, so uh, look out for those gameplays on the YouTube channel. The first few are already up there. The show notes will have the link to the playlist, but they're all up on YouTube at youtube.com slash pateln01. So once I'm done with that gameplay, I'll have a full review, but early thoughts are that it is a pretty fun gameplay and I'm enjoying the theming around it, notably the levels and the weapons and the character or the enemies. So that is all for this particular episode. So as I mentioned, you can check out all the videos, gameplay videos and all that on the YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Patel N01. The website is headphonesneal.reviews for past episodes, subscription links, supporting the show, and all of that good stuff. For early access to the show, um, along with the early access to the YouTube version, you can visit or support the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash Patel N01. But that is all for this particular episode. Thanks for tuning in, and until next time.